hey everyone welcome back to my channel so today i'm gonna walk you through uh, four ent questions for step two ck and i think they can also work for step one so let's get started all right the first question says a um I want you guys to read the last two lines first like I always do with you and by the way if you're just if you've just taken your ENT round you would already figure out the diagnosis from the last two lines in this particular question specifically so let's see here examination the left ear canal shows granulations there is facial asymmetry and the angle of the mouth on the left is deviated downward Essentially, he's telling you that this person has facial nerve paralysis. All right. Now, for some of you that might not have taken ENT recently, I'm going to read the whole question. But for someone who has taken it, they will figure out the diagnosis from this keyword. So, a 65-year-old female, so take note here of the demographic, this is an old patient, complains of difficulty eating over the last two days. She says that food drops out of her mouth. Why do you think so? We've already figured out, guys, because she has facial paralysis, right? There's asymmetry of her mouth on both sides, so that's why it drops on one side. She also has been having some discharge in her left ear recently. She denies any sore throat, nasal discharge, etc. Her past medical history is significant for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She has been poorly compliant with follow-up appointments, which means her diabetes is uncontrolled. So, all diabetic with uncontrolled blood glucose level. Her temperature is 30, so she is feverish. Pulse is 90, seasonal blood pressure. Obviously, she's hypertensive. We already mentioned that here and respiratory 18 examination left ear shows granulations so this patient who has ear discharge he, she's feverish all right and she's an old diabetic poorly controlled diabetes and as a result of this infection that she has she got cranial nerve paralysis facial nerve paralysis this should remind us guys of malignant otitis externa old uncontrolled diabetic is susceptible to malignant otitis externa caused by pseudomonas and the characteristic feature here which is mentioned like i told you in the last two lines are the granulations this is only seen in this case it's only seen with malignant otitis externa so the thing here like why do we call it malignant we call it malignant because it is invasive it crosses bone and that's why it was able to paralyze the facial nerve right not any otitis externa can do that right now there is something called fissures of santorini right there in the cartilage the external canal and this is how the pseudomonas can extend through all the way down and paralyze the facial nerve and other cranial nerves as well. Here's a colored picture. You can extend through these all the way down to the facial nerve right there. So the cause of this condition is notoriously pseudomonas. So once you pick up on this granulations that in an otitis externa case and that it's causing facial paralysis, then you right away should figure out pseudomonas. Now, some people might choose rhizopus, or which is the cause of mucor mycosis, because she's diabetic. But rhizopus doesn't even cause otitis externa. It's far off from this, and rhizopus would cause, you know, uh, necrosis and gangrene, altered mental status. It will extend to the brain, so it's not the same. All right, moving on to the next question. So, I'm going to read the last two lines with you guys. It saves a lot of time. You're going to figure out the diagnosis right away. Nasal pharyngoscopy was a mass in the posterior nasal cavity and biopsy demonstrates poorly differentiated carcinoma. Which of the following is most strongly associated with this patient's current condition? I swear, guys, I can solve this without reading the rest of the stem. So, this patient has nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, right? Tell me, which of these... Which of these choices do you think is a risk factor for nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Now, this is a factoid. You got to know it, all right? So, we know that Epstein-Barr virus 
causes. Nasofer increases the risk of nasopharyngeal carcinoma and Burkitt's lymphoma, if you remember. This is an oncogenic virus that integrates into the DNA. Aflatoxins, those cause liver cancer, right? Obviously, why would recurrent bacterial sinusitis cause cancer? I mean, no. All right. Vitamin A supplements or retinol, no, it's not linked to cancer as well. It's linked mainly to, um, you know, teratogenic. It's teratogenic, I guess. Retinol in pregnant women. But I'm going to still read the rest of the question with you guys. But it will not make a difference in the diagnosis. We already know nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Which of these is a risk factor? And you know it, Epstein Barr. That's it. If I read the rest of the question, it's not going to make a difference. 64 year old man, uh, and he's complaining of these symptoms here slowly progressing left sided neck swelling that is not painful or erythematous. Is a non tender cervical lymph node due to extension of the tumor? Now, when it's a non tender cervical swelling, guys, in an old man should always be suspicious, right? It's not tender and not erythematous means that it's non-inflammatory, which means it's neoplastic, right? He has persistent nasal congestion, epistaxis, and headaches because of the nasopharyngeal carcinoma right there. It's invading locally. It's a malignant tumor. It's obstructing the nose, right? History of rhinosinusitis. Of course, something is right there impacted right there in your nose obviously you're gonna increase the risk of infection etc and sinusitis has been taken over the counter decongestants no relief okay nothing he immigrated from china 15 years ago and it seems like this is kind of endemic in china and africa uh, epstein Barr virus and its resultant uh, sequelae like Burkitt's lymphoma and isopharyngeal carcinoma. So he's showing you here an important demographic as well. But you already know the risk factor right off the bat. All right, moving on to the next question. Okay, again, I'm going to read the last two lines. Ear exam shows a normal tympanic membrane. And by the way, guys, when you find a negative sign like this normal tympanic membrane, you should not skip it just because it's normal. It indicates that there is nothing wrong with the middle ear, right? So negative signs are also important. A rapid test for strep pyogenes is negative. What does this tell you? This right away, by the way, if you look at the choices, it should exclude B altogether. St rapid strep antigen is negative, means it's not bacterial tonsillitis. So I've already narrowed down my choices, right? But still, I did not reach a diagnosis, guys. I'm going to read from the start, okay? A 16-year-old boy, the demographic here is an adolescent, comes to the ER, they do sore throat and fever. You know, any of these can cause sore throat and fever, so it's not specific. He started having a mild sore throat after returning from summer camp about a week ago and has worsened the last two days. Now, the examiner is trying to confuse you and distract you to think that it's something you know infectious cause he probably caught it from the camp etc but you should not fall in this trap the patient also has right neck pain and ear ache but no cough or shortness of breath now guys the fact there is no shortness of breath you know there is no nothing wrong with breathing i think it should exclude epiglottitis because those patients usually suffer a lot anyways you should highlight here right neck pain and earache. And by the way, like what does the throat have to do with earache? It's referred to pain along the glossopharyngeal nerve. Whenever you have a sore throat, you can have earache as a referred pain. So temperature is feverish and he's not sexually active. And this can a little, you know, it may exclude infectious mononucleosis, though I wouldn't, you know... I wouldn't be a damned on this. Pulse is 104 because it's feverish. Enlarged and tender cervical lymph nodes are present. The fact they're enlarged and tender means, of course, because they're draining the infection. The patient is not able to fully open his mouth. And this, by the way, is a very nice sign. It's called trismus. And it is not seen 
with this. So I've already excluded infectious mononucleosis altogether. There is no trismus with infectious mononucleosis. But examination of the oral cavity shows. Now this here is the here is the definitive signs that will give us the diagnosis. Pooling of saliva, large right tonsil with swelling of the right soft palate. You notice here guys that it's unilateral. It's one side only and deviation of the uvula to the left to the other side. Take a look at this picture and tell me. You can see here there is swelling on one side on his right side and because he can't swallow because of the sore throat it's very painful to swallow saliva will keep pulling up right and this enlargement is pushing the uvula to the left, to the other side. This is typical of, the, these are typical signs of peritonsillar abscess. You wouldn't see them with anything else. You know, acute epiglottitis, it's in the epiglottis. If you open the oral cavity, you're going to find nothing like that. All right? And we're already excluded infectious mononucleosis, and even so, it will not cause an abscess, you know? This is a swelling, an abscess. You know, this swelling, is what this abscess means infection is what's causing him the fever because it's painful it's causing him a sore throat and he can't swallow so saliva pulls up you know and air doesn't get in equally so he gets a muffled voice called a hot potato voice and when you open uvula deviation is almost the giveaway here guys so it's a peritonsillar abscess all right let's move on to the last question so a 16 year old boy comes to the office due to right ear pain pruritus and discharge for the past week he had no cold symptoms ear loss or tinnitus the patient returned yesterday from a two-week vacation at a florida beach where he swam and surfed almost daily now i need you guys to highlight this he swam was exposed to water Temperature is normal, no fever, nothing. Manipulation of the right ear during otoscopy elicits pain, which means, okay, when you move the external ear, it elicits pain, which means something was wrong with the external ear. There is prominent swelling and erythema of the ear canal. Again, it's external ear with purulent and crusty debris. I got you a picture, guys, that looks like this. The tympanic membrane appears normal with normal mobility. Again, you should take this as a sign to exclude any involvement of the middle ear. The middle ear is perfect as long as the tympanic membrane is, appears normal and its mobility is normal. So now we are sure it's a problem of the external ear. The left ear is normal, so it's one side only. Everything else is normal. Which of the fungs is the most likely causative organism? So he swam and now he has otitis externa. If you guys remember something called swimmer's ear, all right, the most common causative agent here is pseudomonas. So whenever there is involvement in the external ear, guys, right away you should pick pseudomonas, whether it's otitis, normal otitis externa, or malignant otitis externa in an old diabetic but here in an adolescent who recently swam then it's swimmer's ear which is just normal benign otitis externa that doesn't cause complications of cranial nerve paralysis or anything now why isn't it all these other stuff you know i want to i want to group them to you guys hemophilus influenza and moraxella cataralis and strep pneumo those are kind of like a triad those are the most common causes of otitis media shaking my head smh strep pneumo mark cell cataralis hemophilus influenza those are rarely involved in otitis externa pseudomonas is the leader of otitis externa you know aspergillus of candida these are fungal infections it's not very common and actinomyces israelii this does not even infect the ear it's in the throat so yeah, I hope this video helped guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. All the best guys.